Somewhere, deep in the interior of Kenya, in the dusty village of Ogunja, bus brakes squeal to a halt. A tall and lanky young man steps out and squints in the sunlight. His name is Samba. I get dropped off the bus and I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's a few people hanging around and they're all staring at me like I'm really strange. I'm there with my suitcase. The guy who was supposed to pick me up is not there and I did not feel welcome. Like everyone's staring at me like who is this outsider coming into this village? And so we were walking. He takes me to where I'm going to stay and we're walking through these dirt roads and there's all these trees and it's just empty and isolated and there's no electricity. There's no water and it's just you know nature and he shows me where I'm gonna stay and I'm I'm in, in this hut and I'm like oh my god this is like what I wanted. These are the first seconds of a journey that would determine the rest of Samba's life. The trip that changed everything. Hi I'm Jonathan Gruber and this is The Journey. The Journey is an original podcast from KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, where we meet extraordinary people whose lives are transformed by travel. To find out how today's guest, Samba Schutte, ended up delighted to be in a primitive hut in the middle of nowhere, Kenya, means going a few years back to another African country. Ethiopia. This is where Samba grew up, and let's make this even more complicated. He is not Ethiopian. I mean, I hope you have Google Maps on you because uh, it is really like you need to know your geography. My father is from Holland, and my mother is from Mauritania, which not many people know, but it's a country in West Africa under Morocco. It's pretty huge. It's it's basically the Sahara Desert. They got me. I was born in in Mauritania. And then when I was two, we all moved to Ethiopia, which is on the other side of Africa. And that is where I grew up till I was 18. Samba's father was an international aid worker who met Samba's mother in Mauritania. Famine in the Horn of Africa meant a move to Ethiopia and international schools for Samba. So it's really weird at home because we speak French with my mom because in Mauritania they speak French. And then we speak English uh, with my dad, and I speak English with my brothers and sisters. But all around us, we had to learn Ethiopian. And because of his father, he also needed to learn Dutch. We had a Dutch embassy where they had the, the Dutch school. And every Saturday, a kid's dream come true, we had to go to Dutch school. So you go to school from Monday to Friday, English, French, and then on Saturday morning, you have to go to a school to learn Dutch, which was a nightmare, and I did not like it. And so after the age of 12, I stopped learning Dutch. His background, his lanky height, and mixed-race looks made him something of an outsider, not only at school, but everywhere, really. Kids did not know what to make of me. You know, I'm half black and half white. And I was growing up in Ethiopia. And so I didn't belong in the group of Africans, but I also didn't belong in the group of Europeans. And so I was I was bullied because I was different. And so what I did was I developed jokes to make fun of my bully. And I made fun of him in front of the classroom and everyone started laughing. And then he stopped bullying me the next day. So it was, <laughs> it was like humor was my boxing gloves. Boxing gloves whose jabs and uppercuts were sharpened by the odd VHS tape of American comedians that would make their way from his family in Holland to Samba's TV. He watched them over and over. I did not know what stand-up comedy was. I just knew that there was something out there where you could stand on a stage and tell stories and make people laugh and feel good. And I really was attracted to that. When Samba turned 18, he decided to leave Africa for college. He had a Dutch passport and family roots, so it was kind of a natural choice to move to the Netherlands. But having a Dutch passport doesn't actually mean you are Dutch, especially if you don't speak the language. 
I could not even go to like the the supermarket and try to speak Dutch because they were so frustrated with how bad it was that they just end up speaking English with me. <laughs> But I knew I had to learn it if I wanted to get a career in Holland. And so I started to push myself to to learn the language. And what was really strange was this theme again of being the outsider. I started studying uh, theater. Basically, I was learning how to direct, write, and act. And so I studied at the School of Arts in Utrecht. I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. And so one day there was an open stage show and uh, anybody could go on stage and do something, like perform. And so, you know what, I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna do a, a monologue as an actor. And so I wrote this funny monologue. And I went on stage and all they had was a microphone and I grabbed the microphone and I start doing my funny monologue and people are laughing and laughing and laughing. And after this monologue, someone walks up to me and he says, how long have you been doing stand-up comedy? I said, what, what is stand-up comedy? You know, he's like, this is what you, you were doing on stage. I was like, oh, like, is that stand-up comedy? He's like, yes. And so I was like, oh my God, I just did my first stand-up comedy show. And like most aspirational stand-up comedians, in 2005, Samba decided to spend his college internship teaching improv in Kenya? Uh, they tell you to go on exchange to a country for three months. And I really had a strong desire to go to Africa to really get in touch again with my African roots. Um, because I was, in Ethiopia, I was not considered African, but I really wanted to go to Africa to experience being an African <laughs> in Africa. And so uh, I found this group in Kenya who does theater with different communities. And they basically use theater as a way of dealing with the issues in their societies. And they told me, you have to go to this village called Ugunja, <laughs> where you're going to work with Uh, different kinds of groups. I was like, perfect. This is the exact experience I wanted. I wanted to experience Africa. And Ugunja sounded really African. And so I was like, let's do it. So he did it. Samba traveled to what he called the real Africa, truly far from everything familiar. He was ostensibly there to give theater workshops, but he could have done that anywhere, really. Samba, the eternal outsider, chose Kenya to find a sense of belonging of home. As it turned out, this was the trip that would shape the rest of his life. So I take the seven bus ride to this very remote village and I get dropped off the bus and I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's a few people hanging around and they're all staring at me like I'm really strange. I'm there with my suitcase. The guy who was supposed to pick me up is not there. And I did not feel welcome. Like everyone's staring at me like, who is this outsider coming into this village? And so we were walking. He finally shows up and he takes me to where I'm going to stay. And we're walking through these dirt roads and there's all these trees. And it's just empty and isolated. And there's no electricity. There's no water. And it's just nature. And he shows me where I'm going to stay. And I'm, 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 I'm in this hut. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is what I wanted. And it's basically just a bed in a small hut. The toilet is about 100 meters away. And I go to check out the toilet. It's a hole in the ground with cockroaches coming out of it. And then there's a little uh, shower where you use basically seven cups of water, cold water. To shower. That's all you get. Seven cups of water. <laughs> and uh, I was like, "This is it. This is this is what I wanted." Samba says he wanted the Africa where there were no tourists, no internet, and no comedy tapes. He wanted to be just an African amongst Africans. Well, you know what they say: be careful what you wish for. The first day was terrifying. Everything in me wanted to leave because I never grew up with that. Even though I grew up in Ethiopia, because my dad is Dutch, I we still had a better life than a lot of my friends. 
but there was something inside me that that African side of me that really wanted to experience being in this and ex- and having this to know what it is to understand my roots better. And so, as terrifying as it was, with the lack of everything, I still felt this would enrich me somehow. They had their way of life, and I was entering this way of life for the first time as an outsider, but I wanted to be a part of it. And yes, there was poverty, (laughs) absolutely. And in this village, you know, one in three people were infected with HIV. And in my first night sleeping there, at four in the morning, I heard death wails, you know, people chanting at night and and everything. So yeah, the first night was terrifying, but I was like, you know what, I, I can survive here. I can make it here for three months because this is a part of me too. Samba got his wish. He got a simple hut to live, sweat and contemplate in. He got sick from the food. He got malaria. And he got a room full of fellow outsiders, underage criminals and people who were HIV positive. They were all lumped in together to make something. Okay, good. So emotions are feelings. Emotions are the basis of all acting. When you act, the first thing you think about is how do I feel? I worked with juveniles, you know, people who were being punished for a crime, little kids. And I did not know what crime exactly until I finished working with them. And then people told me, by the way, that guy you're sitting next to, he murdered his parents. You know, that kind of <laughs> that kind of crime. But for me, it was about the connection I was having with these people. I did not see him as a murderer. I did not see that person as having HIV. I did not see this person as being a refugee. I was connecting with human beings who were telling me the story, who are using theater and art as a way of connecting with one another. And that made it all the worthwhile. When rehearsals were done, this group of outsiders, shunned by their society, had created a play which they performed in the center of the village. They start hitting pots and pans and dancing, making music. And then people are attracted to the noise, so they come check it out and slowly start attracting a crowd around you. And uh, then you do your performance. Samba would leave work at the end of the day and retire to his simple hut. He says he was inspired by these people and how, despite their extraordinary differences, they made a real connection with each other and their village through theater. And then... Then he'd think about himself. And so I slowly started to realize, what do I have to offer? I have this weird advantage of being from both worlds, of being the outsider and the insider. My father is European and my mother is African. So I have the European coming into Africa and I have the African coming into Europe. My father is white, my mother is black. So I have the white man coming to Africa, I have the black man coming to Europe. I have my father who is a Christian and my mother who is a Muslim. And I was raised with those two religions and they were able to live together. And so I was like, I have all these different cultural differences, but still I'm united with them inside me. And so I can be the ambassador for all these different cultures to exist together in peace. It's possible. Look at me. I'm fine. (laughs) My parents are fine. And so if I can use theater or something like comedy to connect all these people and to show how similar we are despite how different we think we are, that's the key to really, you know, pursuing my dream and what I want to do. And so if anything, that village experience as traumatizing as some people may think it was it was it was so profound because that's where I realized my role in what my role could be for being a comedian being a storyteller Samba was inspired by his insight his fragmented identity was no longer a weakness but a strength I think it was one of my last nights and so I was you know it's it's there's no electricity so as soon as the sun sets everything is pitch black. And I remember just sitting outside my hut and there are little fireflies, you know, out there by the trees. And then there's billions of stars in the night sky and there are sounds of nature popping up at night. And something in me told me, you know, just write something. It was that night that I was like, I need to 
I need to create a plan. I need to go back to Holland with a mission so I don't forget what I achieved here in these three months. Basically, in that hut is where I realized what I have to offer as a performer. So I developed my identity as a comedian in that hut, in a dark night with the mosquitoes biting my feet, <laughs> writing this plan by candlelight in my, in my diary. And Samba was serious about this plan, really serious. I made a plan uh, for the next five years of what I wanted to achieve in my life and how I would achieve it. And the last thing after those five years was move to L.A. I'm going to go back to Holland after Kenya. I'm going to do my stand-up comedy in Dutch. I'm going to participate in a competition that will launch my career as a comedian with this new message. I will build on that, and eventually the end goal will be to move to America, to Los Angeles, to continue giving this message. A few days later, Samba returned to Holland. The speed of life in the West was an overwhelming culture shock. Everything was moving so fast in Holland, and there was internet that worked very fast in Holland, and there was distractions and mobile phones and everything. But I was like, I'm not going to forget, I'm not going to forget. So I, I printed out my five-year plan. And so I started to do stand-up comedy in Dutch with my new identity. I used to just do stand-up in my regular clothes. But when I came back to Holland after Kenya... I started doing stand-up comedy wearing an African shirt and jeans to symbolize me coming from two worlds and barefoot because I wanted to remember the feeling of walking barefoot around in the village. He wrote a one-man show about his life and struggles. It went so well, he entered the country's biggest showcase, the Lides Cabaret Festival. If you win that, you can basically count on bookings in the whole country. Thank you, Mel. Hello, my name is Samba. I know what you think, so the name Samba Hort. Then think you on. No, the gonya, the rabi, 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 the The show was called Kunmin Woni An, which is Mauritanian for I am who you are. And that was the theme of the show. I wanted to do a show about coming from two worlds and how my whole life that made me feel like an outsider. But then by the end of the show, I realized that it's a gift that actually brings people together. And so I wrote the show, I practiced it. And when I was accepted to participate in the Lights Cabaret Festival... I remember on the, the final night, I was uh, sitting on the stage and I remembered that moment in the hut where I had visualized this moment, that I'm about to launch my career in Holland as a known comedian. This is the moment where everything happens. Uh, I did not expect to win. But the results came in and 90% of the audience had voted for me for the audience favor prize. And then the jury uh, had no criticism on my show, which was the first time that happened in, in the history of the Lights Cabaret Festival. We have nothing to say. You're the winner of the Lights Cabaret Festival. And so that night I won both the jury and the audience prize. And boom, the dream came true. This was a big deal. Samba's win was even the top story on that evening's news. Goedenavond. Samba Schutte heeft gisteravond het 28e Leids Cabaret Festival gewonnen. You ain't seen nothing yet. So when you heard that you'd won, what went through your head? I have the video of that too, and I, I you see me on stage so confused and <laughs> and so in disbelief because. This moment that I had focused on for three months, so specifically in that hut, and that I'd worked so hard on when I moved back to Holland after Kenya, after that trip, and, it, and seeing it come true, the moment that would help me make my dream come true of moving to L.A., it was, it was, I was in disbelief. <laughs> 
So after that, everything exploded. From the next day onwards, I suddenly was on uh, different interviews for TV shows and magazines and newspapers, and I was touring with my show that I won the final with around the country, and I was booked to do a one-man comedy show. So I had to write that, and I wrote a 80-minute show that I did with that same theme of coming from two worlds but still being united. And that show did really well, and I toured around the whole country of Holland for three years with that show doing at least 120 shows around the country in different theaters. And at the same time, for Dutch people who were living abroad. Samba performed in Turkey, Malaysia, Indonesia, Curaçao, and even Libya before the fall of Gaddafi. Everywhere he went, people laughed at his self-deprecating humor and understood his message of the joys of diversity. I see that they're not that different, these major religions of the world. You know, the same basic principles, same foundations, same God. Yes, one is better at dealing with cartoons than the other, but you know, they're not that different. So I was like, you know, why not just combine them? Just be Christian and Muslim and, and Jewish too. Then I will always have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. It's perfect. Genius. Samba was a hit, he was a star, he was making good money, and he was ready to give it all up because he still had a five-year plan written by candlelight in a dusty Kenyan hut. Yes, the fame was fantastic and the money was fantastic and I was living such a comfortable life, but I knew that my message was not just for Holland. I have to move to the market that has the biggest reach, which is Hollywood. This is where messages are heard loudest around the world. Hollywood. It wasn't an easy decision. In 2010, Samba had a new show in Dutch and 80 dates booked. He took a trip to Portugal to mull things over. And there, walking in the woods, he came upon a tree. This tree reminded him of the trees near the hut in the village in Kenya, the place where he'd made his other big decision. So, and Samba admits this sounds a little nuts, he sat down and he asked the tree what to do. And the answer was, trust life. Trust life that when you follow your heart, everything will work out for you. I had no idea how I would get to Hollywood. It's not easy just to move to LA. You need a visa, you need an agent, you need some kind of connection to, to start your career. And I had no idea how that would work out, but I knew I had to make a decision first and then trust life like I did in that village and just let go and keep it simple and follow your heart. So I went back to Holland, told my managers in the theaters, I'm stopping, I'm moving to LA. And they all called me crazy and what are you doing? You, you're, you're, you're a star, you have all this stuff, are you crazy? You're, just, you're gonna lose it all. And so they said, you'll never perform here again, your career is over. But I knew I had to still listen to myself and, and, and follow my heart. His Dutch agents weren't the only ones who thought moving to L.A. was a bad idea. Everyone called me crazy. The people who were close to me did not want me to lose all this because um, they were afraid for what would happen for me in L.A. Because you hear these stories of people who fail miserably and have nothing. But I knew that I had made it through the roughest, toughest time in the village. So in 2010, Samba packed up and moved to L.A. Once there, he signed up for a showcase in which a whole bunch of aspiring stars perform for a whole bunch of hungry agents looking for talent. So basically you present a monologue to agents and if they like you, they will represent you. And so I could not find a monologue that represented who I was as a person. So I wrote my own monologue about coming from two different worlds and how all these cultures are inside me, but how no one knows what I am because of that. And so I performed this monologue in front of 21 agents and seven of them wanted to work with me. And so I was like, boom, my message has resonated with these people. My name is Nicholas Ray. Uh, I am the owner, agent of the Alvarado Ray Agency in Los Angeles. 
Nicholas Ray is the agent who signed Samba after the showcase. We reached him on the phone in L.A. I saw him in the showcase there, and when I saw him, I thought, wow, this guy is great. So I invited him for an interview to the office, and here I had him do a call reading and some improvisations. And then I realized I wanted to work with him because he was so talented, and I've been working with him ever since. And um, what exactly was so special about him that you thought to yourself, I have got to sign this guy? Uh, his energy. He, he, his energy was very, very high. And he was very happy, and he was very present. Well, he's very unique because what he rep- represents. Uh, he's a combination of races, and he's very tall, and he's very funny, and he's very quick. So I had to get a visa to work here as an artist. And check this out. This is the name of my visa. Alien of Extraordinary Ability. (laughs) Let me just say that again because it makes me feel so good. (laughs) Alien of Extraordinary Ability. (laughs) That's the real name of my visa. You could Google it. Someone at immigration came up with this name. Someone was there at a meeting on a Tuesday afternoon just going, ah, I just want to go home, but we got to come up with a name for aliens with talent. Ah, I just want to go home and watch this movie with my wife. Ah, What what, what movie are you guys going to watch? E.T. It's about this alien with extraordinary ability. Oh my God, yes! (laughs) Samba's stand-up is getting noticed, like a steady gig at the iconic comedy store. It's one of the biggest comedy clubs in Los Angeles where artists like Richard Pryor started and Jim Carrey and Robin Williams. And I participated in a competition there and I won that contest. And the manager saw me perform and he's like, you know what, kid, you got something. I want you to perform here every week on the stages. And so that's how I got into the comedy store working as a comedian. And while American comedy is often edgy or profane, most people get Samba's message of positive inclusivity. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing to have a mission, to have a, a, a goal to, to do besides acting. Um, it's good because the world is becoming that. You see, we're all coming together and uniting into one thing. So I, see, I think that's part of that. And Samba is no longer an alien of extraordinary ability, by the way. He just got his green card, which makes him a permanent resident of the United States. He also recently got married. He and his American wife now live in the place he always dreamed of. My studio apartment is in, like, Hollywood. So we're here. You can see the Hollywood sign from my backyard. What's the building called? This is the uh, Harlow. All the buildings on this street are named after actors. There's the Monroe, there's the Clark Gable, there's a Harlow where we're leaving. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it feels good to be among the stars. <laughs> An agent, an apartment close to the Hollywood sign, a green card. Samba says he's ready for his next step, major TV and movie productions. There was a a couple of films I did right now, The Tiger Hunter, which is about an Indian immigrant moving to America. And I play one of the characters there. Like I said, I'm an immigrant, guys. As you can tell, I'm Dutch. (laughs) No? Didn't get that from the height? No, nothing. (laughs) I know I don't look Dutch, guys, all right? I know what I do look like, though, because on the streets, freaking Indians always walk up to me going, Hey, brother, (laughs) pashti bhi kar nera chena hai, boni ki na kani ki na meri chahe na kani ki na. I go, whoa, whoa, look, buddy, I get it, but no, I'm not, um, I'm not Indian. And they're really pushy, right? Because they're they're thinking, hey, hey, no, no, look at my dot when I'm talking to you. You are Indian. (laughs) No, I'm I'm not Indian. You are very tall for an Indian, yeah. (laughs) You look like an avatar. (laughs) Samba says it was tough coming to America on his own. You have to find your way and you have to do it by yourself. But I think because of the experience in Kenya, I was already used to that and knew that I would would be fine, I would survive. My ultimate goal is to be very successful in my career as an actor and a comedian, spreading this message of unity, to make a lot of money and to have enough influence that I can 
help poor societies and people who are suffering to come together to help them sustain themselves and not only have this message of unity, but to actually do something about giving equal opportunity to everyone. But Samba, you're just one person. What makes you think you can do something about it? (laughs) (laughs) I know. It is. It's one person. But if anything, that village taught me is that it only takes one person to tell you something good about yourself or something positive and inspiring, and it can change your life. One person at a time. And if I can change a few minds in my lifetime, I have achieved what I wanted to do. Hopefully that person whose mind I have changed will change someone else's mind and then spread it out that way. And how will you know you've succeeded? I think when at the end of my life I get to talk to a tree and he tells me, you know what, kid, you did it. (laughs) Samba Schutte. If you want to know more about Samba, go to our website, podcast.klm.com. You've been listening to The Journey, an original podcast brought to you by KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. To hear more stories about the trip that changed everything, go to podcast.klm.com. And why not review us on iTunes? It helps other listeners find this podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm Jonathan Gruber.